people who get locked into a vision all right that's it man that's their drive that's their passion critics don't matter this don't matter they're gonna do whatever it takes to be the best at what they do all right guys so what do you have first question here from instagram is uh could you go could you give us a run through on how you learned to visualize your lifts and uh anything as yeah. far as that process i think we did a table talk on this so i'm going to try to condense it a little bit because you can go search this i think the title of the video was something along the lines of float tanks but i was part of a experiment i guess you would say that, a study i was part of a study when i was a senior in high school which extended to that summer period afterwards where we were using deprivation tanks which essentially were just float tanks back then and nowhere near as nice as what they are now or as big as what they are now but part of it was to see how it would enhance sport performance and how it would enhance visualization and so forth so before i could go through and be a part of that they spent a lot of time teaching me how to visualize so there's there's a lot of different ways on how to visualize jm when he was out here spoke on a few you know he spoke on you know meditation actually being a base for the visualization so a good place to start is to admit that we're not doing nearly enough as coaches or as personal athletes training ourselves to work on this so ask yourself how much do I think whatever I do is, is mental and how much of it is physical? I have some funny stories I can tell about me trying to learn how to meditate since JM's been here. Um, and it's been a disaster. So I got to keep working at it until I master that skill, if it even is a skill that can be mastered. But with visualization, to step back into what the question is, what finally resonated and helped me really tie this all in is i believe it was a book written by dr judd by soto i may be pronouncing the last name wrong i think in 2001 a sports odyssey it was advertised in powerlifting usa in the 80s and i think i'm not 100 percent sure it could also have come from defining gravity which was a bill star book so i'm not i get a lot of those older ones mixed up I don't go back through them very often. I should, but I don't. But the, um, using, the use of a candle to get into a relaxed state is what really helped me is I would just focus on the candle, focus on the flame while sitting relaxed at a desk. You know, so I, there, was a, there was a back to the chair, so it wasn't a stool and it wasn't a sitting on the edge of the bed it was sitting at a desk with my arms relaxed on the desk and just visualizing and focusing on the flame until all I could see was the flame and all you know you try to not see anything beyond that anything that comes in you just kind of let it go right back out so if a thought came in kind of the same thing as what jam was saying is you know as a thought came in i would just let it go thought can you become more proficient at just being able to let it go so the first part of the whole process was to be able to just get into the flame and stare at the flame for five minutes without really a, not that many distractions there's always distractions and then from there getting into a point to where you can visualize the max lift that you wanted to achieve and that's usually the best place to start that i found is it's it's going to create the most anxiety for somebody trying to visualize so i like to start with things hard instead of easy which is just my way of doing things the easier way which i'll, I'll get into that is you know daydreaming and so forth but i have a history with that so by doing that, I only had to focus on one lift or three lifts, you know, the, whatever the goals were for the meet coming up. And then once I was able to actually see those with some perception, 
so it might have been like very very blurry black and white grayscale imagery of me seeing myself do it so not actually being in the moment but me seeing myself do that over time it became more clear it became more vivid it became more you know colorful it became uh feeling the bar more senses i started to pull in you know what what it looked like what it smelled like what it felt like um the taste in the air you know anything that i could associate with a gym or meat i associated with that once i got to that point because that keep in mind now i'm only focusing on a few different things it's not like i'm focusing on everything i have to do for a day after that Then when I got deep into the study, it was to visualize every training session before the training session at least once. And it's, in all honesty, I don't think I ever did it more than once because to actually visualize the whole training session, it takes a lot of time. You know, it it takes pretty much the same amount of time as it takes to do the training session because if you're visualizing putting, you know, I wore cowboy boots all, every day of my life all the way up until I graduated from high school. So pulling my cowboy boots off in the gym and putting on, I believe it was work boots is what I squatted in because we, I didn't know what weightlifting shoes were. So I wanted a little heel. So it was fake Timberlands or whatever the cheapest shoe store boots that looked like timberlands that had a heel were so just visualizing the process of pulling that changing the shoes and putting the shorts on and putting the suit on and all those processes then the sets and the reps and the warm-ups and how the bar feels on the back and then the pressure how it increases on the back so it's it's a long time journey but the the key thing is you have to be able to be in a state to be able to see what you want to see And then to be able to be in a state that you're okay if things go all right, you know. So if you're visualizing and you're halfway through your warm-up sets and all of a sudden, you know, you start visualizing an ambulance going past the front door and a crowd of people falling from the sky or some other stupid shit, you just let them fall and then you just get back to your next set and you go from there. So that was something that in the sensory tank, or the flotation tank helped tremendously with this, by the way, because it it really put me in a state to be able to have huge clarity. And I don't know if it was the floating or, you know, the you're, you're locked in a chamber more or less, you know, so you can't hear shit, you, know, you can't see shit. It's totally black. So and it's 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 kind of hard, you know, to get up and leave you know so there's that that helped a lot that brought a lot of clarity with that and then from i've always maintained that ability and that skill in the gym to be able to put myself into whatever mental state i needed to be in almost at a moment's notice i just need a couple minutes for that i use visual markers to be able to tie the the state to a mark okay so if you guys watch my stupid training videos you'll see that i use chalk and i'll mark f u on my leg or i'll mark it on my chest and you know obviously it stands for fuck you but that's me you know telling the bar whatever resistance that's against me fuck you i have you know i own this but it's also something that when I first start visualizing, you know, if it's in the gym or wherever it is, and it is something that's going to involve some kind of mental state that I have to take control of and take complete ownership of, I visualize that first. So I visualize that mark first, and then I visualize it at the end. So as soon as I put that mark on me, it's kind of a trigger from my mind to know okay here's where we need to go next and from the visualization standpoint i can use it to 
push to a more aggressive state there's there's a there's a peak arousal phase so you can go too far you know to where you you fuck yourself up you get too fired up or you get too zippied up and then you that's what my nickname was at west side because i get too fired up and it just things become a fucking mess so there's there's two states that i'll put myself one in one is calm aggressive and that would be if if i know i can do confident it all boils down to confidence so i want to lay that truth out first that i don't give a fuck what you need to do if you have to listen to certain music if you have to put on certain headphones if you have to have a certain ritual or a certain routine whatever you have to do to put yourself in a confident state that's that's the end result here from the training standpoint is the confidence i don't care how the hell you got to get there just find your way to get there so for me if i'm confident that i can do the weight but it might get a little funky like this last saturday i believe i tried something new which was kind of stupid i didn't know how it was going to plan out but it was to use 20 chains on each side and then work the weight up as after the chains were already loaded and i realized real quick this is this is this is not going to be the smartest thing because the chains dictate the movement until you get over a certain amount of straight weight on the bar to where that can kind of counter the chains. Well, with 20 chains per side, I'm not strong enough to get that amount of straight weight on the bar to where the chains are not going to determine where the movement's gonna go. So regardless of the setup and how clean we are gonna keep the setup, on the last set or my max effort set when i visualized that one i wasn't visualizing flames and aggressiveness and bars on fire and you know a lot of different things that i'll visualize for an aggressive state i was visualizing a calm aggressive state to where i would still be in that same place mentally but have the ability to have extreme focus and to think because i knew as soon as i stood up I was going to have to compensate the entire eccentric while going down because the chains are kind of spinning and, you know, kind of going wherever they want to go and then make the decision when I was on the box to sit there longer than normal, just to let everything settle and stop. And I actually had to sit back further than normal before I could come back up. Had I tried to do, that max effort exercise with fury aggression i would have missed the weight so another part of this is knowing what the obstacle is that you have to overcome to know what the proper mental state you need to try to put yourself in for that to fall back on something that jm spoke about i think everybody should go back and listen to that podcast with jm blakely because he touched on this and love to get him back out, touch on it a little bit more. He's already submitted uh, one article and he's working on the second one. So we're going to have a lot of content from him shortly in regards to this and also in regards to training because we really didn't get a chance to get into the training all that much is the best way to learn. And I never, it never really dawned on me until he said this was daydream. You know, so if you don't know how to visualize, just daydream more, you know, just take time out of your day, you know, remove yourself from your normal state. So if you're at your desk, go sit at a different desk. You know, if you normally sit on a certain chair, go sit in a different chair, remove yourself from your state, find a different state, and then just daydream, just think about different shit. And I realized when he said that, that pretty much that was my whole childhood, you know, was, you know, being alone, spending time alone, making, making time to be alone because I didn't want to be around other people and just sitting, you know, and staring at the clouds and, you know, I don't want to say pondering life because I'm in elementary school. So what the hell are you actually pondering? You know, you're just sitting there daydreaming about different shit but you're learning how to self-talk you're learning how to you know control your thoughts you're learning how to refocus you're learning how to um, 
pivot your brain, you know, how to, how to control it. You're learning, you know, if you're learning, you have the ability to change the narrative, you know, on what you're thinking about and, and you're able to get out of the rut of whatever thought that you're in to be able to get into another one. So I think that is a, is a great place to start. I can't disagree with JM in any way whatsoever. For most people, that's probably the best way to to start the whole process because if they can't relax the brain, there's no way, or their mind, you know, there's there's no way they're going to be able to to visualize, even though you still do. All right, and you gotta you gotta think about that a little bit when you're driving to the gym. You will, you know, if you're serious about what you're doing, you are daydreaming, you are visualizing what you're going to do in the gym you're just not doing it in a in a state where you're actually trying to picture it nor should you when you're trying to drive to the gym and so that's where i would say i'd start on that it's a it's a long lengthy answer but there's i'm sure there's very simple ways to be able to say it but i think it needs to be elaborated on because the one other thing that JM said to me that really stuck is that, you know, and because he went on a hiatus basically for 20 years, you know, 15, 20 years, and still was training people. I mean, he didn't disappear, disappear. He just was not part of the whole online thing. And trust me, we're, we're <laughs> we and many, others or a few others are just trying to teach him how to use the internet so just think about that for a minute um so while we're trying to teach him how to use the internet you know he's he's been away a lot from what's going on you know in the industry and was really fascinated that you know because training doesn't change that much you know anybody that says otherwise is pretty much full of shit it just it just becomes re, renamed, uh, re-engineered, repurposed. You know, nothing's really new. And in the past 20 years, we're, we're still, nobody's talking about the mental aspects of sport participation or the mental aspects of strength. And it's been 20 years. You know, but yet every coach will tell you that it makes up a majority of the athlete's potential. So it's now how it makes up that majority can be debated, you know, where that's why I like the word confidence, because, you know, you take somebody that's confidence, that has confidence and then has the physical attributes, you know, and the ability to to play the game or the ability to lift they're going to be a hard person to beat. They're going to be a tough person to beat. But the problem happens is, you know, in power sports or strength sports, you're going to get hurt. You know, it comes with the territory. Every time you get a ding, your confidence takes a dent. You know, so you can have somebody who's supremely confident you know, five years ago, and then five years of dings, dents, and a couple pulls here and there, they don't have any confidence anymore, and they're not worth a shit. So they actually end up getting their ass smoked by the person who wasn't confident coming into the sport, but has built it and has built that mental strength and mental fortitude to be able to overcome adversity and to move forward no matter what. And they're the ones that usually end up kicking ass in the end. What do we got next? What were your most beneficial pursuits outside of powerlifting? So maybe not so much, not necessarily what was the most successful pursuit, but what was the most beneficial to you? My wife. I mean, I don't know what you mean by beneficial. You know, it's, it's, you know, beneficial sounds like self-serving, you know, where anything that you're going to pursue in life while we are all individuals You know, anything that's really self-serving is going to be an injustice to your, your being and your life. I think, you know, you, you, it has to be something that's, you know, of, 
of mutual benefit, you know, that's going to complement instead of just build, you know. So, for example, you can have yes people around you all the time, you know, form a whole group of yes people all the time, and you'll never get better, you'll never be challenged, but you're going to feel great, man, you're going to feel right all the time years later those people disappear and you have no self-validation you have nothing you know so you have to have people around you that are going to challenge you you know that are going to make you accountable hold you accountable uh, make you responsible and make you want to be responsible and accountable i think that's probably a better way to state that is you should want to be accountable. You should want to be responsible for something because that's those are things that you can then take ownership of. And those are things that can build you as an individual, but build, you know, the family as well. So it's kind of a weird framed question because I don't think I'm answering it the way it was actually intended. So let's just skip on to something else. Uh, what's the most important thing you learned early in your training career? Show up. Um, consistency matters probably more so than anything when you become when you've been doing this shit for 15 20 years I can probably make a debate to tell you that inconsistency is probably going to be more beneficial for the lifter than consistency but we're talking about outliers here but in the very beginning just showing up if it's something that you want to be great at, if it's something that you want to push the boundaries of and be the best at that you can do, then you have to be there. You know, you even if you can't train, you have to be there. You know, if you put it this way, if it's let's I'm going to bring everything back to powerlifting because it's very, very simple to use an example to explain pretty much everything. Because the goal is to increase the squat bench and deadlift over a period of time. It's a very simple goal, you know, to become better at those things. So that can e relate to pretty much everything except, you know, personal relationships. So with that standpoint, if, if you're too sore or you're too binged, banged up or you have rhabdo or you broke your arm or whatever it is, you still show up because you're going to learn from watching the other people train, you know, assuming that you're with a training group, you know, if you're not with a training group and you train alone and you just show up in the gym and you're just hanging out watching people, you know, kind of spotting, helping people who are, um, who are new, you know, to the gym, the, the more people that you help, the more that you're reinforcing what you know. So you're learning more, the more you're around it, the more you pick up things that you normally wouldn't pick up. So when you can't train on the days that you're injured or hurt or deloading or whatever it is, on those days that you can't really train like everybody else in your training group or everybody else in the gym, those are the days you're actually going to be more perceptive on what people do. So when you're paying attention to you know, how does this more advanced lifter, how do they approach the bar compared to how you approach the bar? You know, how do they walk it out compared to how do you walk it out? You know, how, how do they enter the gym compared to how you enter the gym? You know, what do they do when they get in the gym? What do you do? You know, so you'll start to see similarities, you know, and, and common factors amongst the people that are stronger than you'll see amongst those that are just beginning. But if you don't show up, then you miss that learning opportunity. The other thing is if you're a beginner or an intermediate and you're not there, you know, then you're just reinforcing to the people who are looking at you, trying to decide, you know, hey, look, should we help this guy out? Should we bring him in our group? Should we do this? Should we do that? All you're doing is reinforcing to them that nah, maybe we shouldn't do that because there's a time investment involved with 
you know, helping people, assuming there's not a transaction involved, you know, that people are helping people the way it's kind of been through the last 50, 60 years when it comes to strength sports, you know, they're going to help people who actually give a fuck. You know, they're not going to put a lot of time into people who don't care because it's a disservice to the people who do care. So if you're acting like a person that doesn't care, then that's exactly how you're going to be treated in return. If you're acting like a person that does, then that's how you're going to be treated there. So show up. All right, this was an interesting one. Put some thought into it. Uh, what, not that you don't for your other ones, but if you could assemble a powerlifting crew right now with everyone in their prime, who would they be? That's interesting because there's a there's a huge component that's missing here. And I don't know the author, but I think it was a sales book or a business book written years ago called Rainmaker or The Rainmaker. And it's basically talking about those people that come into businesses and they just kill it. I mean, they're they're the sales guys that are selling, you know, ten times more than all the other sales guys. I mean, they're they're the people that grow companies. They're the people that the rainmakers. You know, they're the people that take companies to a completely different level. And research and I'm saying this loosely because I can't quote the research and I can't tell you to where even to go from that so supposedly you know research has been done to be able to show that you can take you know a rainmaker that say it's a a car dealer in a certain dealership or um, a lawyer partner in a certain practice or the best surgeon in a certain hospital and so on and so on and so on you can take them and they can leave and go to another company so and it happens all the time so they go to another company because the benefits are better or pays better what it, whatever it's going to be whatever the reason for it is and when they're at that other company they're no longer a rainmaker. You can see this in professional sports. A lot of the time is athletes will be traded. Sometimes the great athlete becomes an average athlete. Sometimes the average athlete becomes a great athlete. So what I'm getting at here, it's it's the culture that matters. So you can, yes, the rainmaker matters, right? But they can't make rain unless they're in the right culture. If they're not in the right culture that fits them, then they're just going to be average. And that's where, you know, it's, this, this conversation can go a lot of different ways. That's where if, you know, you're the owner or the manager of a company and you see somebody that's, you know, not getting better and they're not increasing their skill set and they're just kind of stagnant. You know, one of the best things that you can do for them is to release them to the market, you know, because there's a good probability that they might end up in a different culture. And then that other culture is more conducive to, to them. And then they blow up and they become what they can really become. You know, if it's somebody that's working in a culture that they, they're they stifled, you know, they they just, they, they hate it. You know, they got to sit in their car for five, six minutes before they can even walk into work. And granted, again, trust me, I've been there. I've done that. It's part of every job. So I'm by no means am I saying you have a couple of weeks that are like that or days and you're like, fuck this job, I'm going to leave. It's part of every job. You're going to go through phases like that. I'm talking where it's like that all the time. And there's no like, man, this is cool. I want to work on this project or, you know, there's, there's none of that. Um, leave, you know, and find someplace else because 
culture matters. Culture, without the right culture, there is no rainmaker. So now what you're asking me is if I could assemble a team of power lifters to get them to train together, you know, what would be the most awesome team to be able to put together? I can't answer that question because I can sit there and say, man, how awesome would it be to be able to have like a, a Vogelpohl, Cohn, and Goggins to put those guys, three guys all in the same gym. We're talking three entirely different cultures that these guys trained in, entirely different. You know, Steve had a lot of his training basically in the military, not military type training, but you know, the most of the beginning of his powerlifting career was, you know, being associated with military rec. And, you know, Chuck at Westside Barbell and Ed had one or two really, really good training partners in a stretch. And but for the most part was controlling his own flow, you know, from from that hall went. So it, it would be a disaster. You know, so it, they wouldn't they wouldn't help each other. They would have all been worse. So it's it's a tough one. You know, and it's easier. It's it's easy for me to answer because I trained at Westside for 14 years, which is a culture that was designed to be able to help propel, you know, lifters to top levels. But I can tell you with 100 percent certainty, there were far more lifters that came and left within a week than stayed and actually became better than they could have ever been on their own and that's not that's not a dig at west side in any way whatsoever it's just you had it was a certain culture it was a certain environment that some people would thrive in most would not now the some people that would thrive in it actually i think were pulled up to a higher level than what they could have had they been on their own you know, so I, I don't think there's a right answer to that. I do think that there's some lifters that that trained alone, but that they still need spotters and shit like that. There's there's some lifters I think that that trained alone that might have been a little bit better if they had a couple more people training with them that were pushing them just a tad not not too much because it's see you got to keep in mind where i'm coming from here guys you know it's the majority of my of my time in the sport was around people that were ranked in the top 20 and above so it's really easy for somebody to come in and say you start somebody comes in and pushes that top guy but it ends up pushing them over the ledge now they're hurt they're fucked up and they're not worth a shit so sometimes it's better for them to not have that person and then just to rely on their own personal instinct that got them where they are at you know from that standpoint but let's chop this answer down make this simple for every beginner and almost every intermediate lifter if you're training alone you will do better if you were to hook up and train with a couple other people who have the same desire and passion for the sport as what you do, I know it's hard. You know, I went through years of trying to find different groups of people, you know, to train from, and you gotta kind of scout them out. You gotta kind of vet it, and then you gotta be accepted to that group, you know? So, and today it's probably much harder than it was when I was doing that, but, I think that you're doing your lifting a disservice if you're not around people who know the sport, they know the technique, you know, and know the know the game a little bit, know the training a little bit, know signs, you know, signs of overreaching, signs of maybe not training hard enough, and especially the technique. Technique's a big part. You know, little changes to that technique can make a big difference, and they're hard to make when you're training alone in your basement and you're sending one video clip of two reps to somebody you really don't even know that well 
once a week to be able to tell you what to do for the next week. So that's my answer there. Okay. Um, this is from the live stream here. It said, uh, biggest tip to someone who wants to be the next Dave Tate. Don't. Uh, don't, man. Just why would you want to do that? You know, it's I was taught at a really young age. So young, I can't ever remember that to, to never have idols. You know, it was it was drilled into my head from basically everybody around me. You know, if even if it was a sports idol or do not fucking look up to anybody. Um, you can look up to certain people for certain traits that they represent, but don't have idols, you know, so don't be, don't be me. Don't try to be like me, be you, you know, be, be the best you that you can possibly be. So if you, if you don't know what that is, then take time and try to figure out who the fuck you are, you know, which it's not an easy process. It takes some mindfulness, you know, and self-awareness to try to figure out who you really are. And then once you think you know who you really are, you're probably fucking wrong. Because when you start asking people, you find out that's not exactly who you thought you were in the first place. So figure that out and then figure out where you want to become better and, and then work those skills you know, look at how you can become better at those traits and those abilities. And you can certainly, you know, look up to certain individuals for traits that they represent and try to emulate, you know, those traits and go on from there. But by no means, you know, just, just don't have idols, man. It's just, you know, I just leave it at that. You know, it's, it was written. It was in. It was written in a book a really long time ago to not have idols. So let's just leave it at that. Hey Dave, could you talk about your move from employee to entrepreneur? Any tips on starting a business? I hate to be that person to say that. Well, in a way, I've always been an entrepreneur. You know, because that's such bullshit. You know, I used to sell lemonade at a lemonade stand. All this dumbass stuff, but. My parents did own their own business, so I did grow up around a dinner table with business being discussed. Not all the time. You know, they kept they kept most of it in the store, but just like anybody who owns a business with their significant other, you know, conversations are going to carry over to the home, and then they are overheard by small ears. You know, and you pick up on things. And so some of the things I picked up on at a really young age is it's not worth selling unless it's the highest quality you can sell. The customer service will be easier. The warranties will be easier. You know, the complaints will be less, you know, because you're selling the best. You know, if you're going to sell shit, then you better get used to handling a lot of issues. You know, I also grew up around you know, the philosophy that, you know, and people will disagree and say it's not true, but that the customer is always right. And I do get it, man. I've been in business for 21 years. So I get, yeah, yeah, I get it. A lot of times the customer is not right, but you don't need to tell them that. You know, I think maybe twice out of 21 years, if I had to have a critical conversation with a customer that was just flat out trying to rip us off, um, it's rare, you know, the, and I'm sure it happens, you know, all the time, but you can't put all your focus on that. It's got to focus is going to be on the, the, the people that are supporting you for the right reasons and doing a hell of a job doing it. So moving forward, you know, it's, I worked as a bouncer, so that's kind of, most of the jobs that I, I did, I, I worked every, not every day, but I've had a job since I was basically 12, working for my parents. And then every job I had after that, with the exception of a couple, were kind of independent contractor related. You know, every bouncing position I had was essentially an independent contractor 
trying to figure out how to earn more tips, you know, through, you know, many different means that you would have as a bouncer trying to earn tips and pay your way through college is a gym manager. You know, most of the revenue was based upon commission. So it was sales there and then the management skills of being the gym manager. So I've always kind of been around that environment. And when I came to Columbus and started working as a personal trainer in a corporate training center, things were a lot more formalized and more systemized, which I hadn't seen before, not not to this scale. And I saw the value in that and I saw how that could really make a difference. So that did leave an imprint on me as far as the pros and cons on how that worked. But after six years of commission and salary, it was kind of a mix of both with that. I decided to go as a straight independent contractor with them so I could work on Elite FTS and didn't feel it was right to do that between clients while I was in their building and their offices and so forth. And so that I never had that entrepreneurship bug or, or fear, or it just seemed like the thing to do. And I really wasn't fucking good at much else. So it's, You know, most of my life, it's always kind of been like, well, what am I going to do? You know, even now, like if the business tanks, it's, you know, if JL is still in business, I got a deal worked out with him, you know, that we'll hire each other if anything ever goes bad. But shit, if something goes bad, something goes bad with me, I'm fucked. You know, I'm going to be working for a temporary service, you know, and trust me, I got no problem working for McDonald's or Subway if I have to do that to pay the bills. No problem whatsoever been there before do it again um no issues with that so that's always been there from from that standpoint now and i've been poor most of my adult life i grew up middle class but as soon as i left the house it it became rough class for a long time so money management was fairly easy because it's was always being rolled back into, you know, trying to save for a house. And then, you know, from there, you know, so everything has been looked at as an investment. So I would rather invest in the company than pay myself more. And fortunately, my wife, who is the co-founder, thinks the same way. So what was the second part of the question? Any tips on starting a business? All right. The, the, what I really wanted to answer, but I wanted to give some kind of context behind that, is, yeah, there, there came a day to where I had to make the decision of walking away from the personal training job that I had, which I was also managing the personal training program. So there was salary associated with it. There was commission associated with it. There were bonus associated with it. There was a lot associated with it. So I was doing, I was doing well. I was doing actually very well. And some years, you know, more well than I still do now. So, I mean, there was a lot of, so there was a decision that had to be made to where it was, okay, I have to make this step or this is never going to happen. And that was a hard decision. And it was one that I probably waited two years too long to do. And I see it common with a lot of the people that I help, that I mentor, you know, that are kind of going through the same process is I know as soon as they start asking, it's always going to take about two years longer than what I would want them to do it and two years longer than what they think they're going to really think that it should be done or what they what they they will all go back and say man i should have did it you know two years sooner but it helps me when i'm mentoring them from that standpoint of knowing that it's 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 going to take longer but the advice that i would have in situations like that 
and I did not follow this advice, by the way, is because I, I, I went from income to no income. And that's a big difference. Now, my wife still was working and had her job, but it wasn't the greatest paying job, but we could pay the bills. So we weren't putting ourselves into financial irresponsibility. We are just putting ourselves into ramen noodles again. <laughs> but the the advice that I would give is a lot of people who are working in their full-time job and then they want to start their own thing, you know, on the side. In today's world, they're going to be doing both at the same time, at least for a while, you know. And it's, I think that's a good thing. I think it's a lot of hours, right? And But it's a good thing because once it, it does become your own thing, those a lot of hours are going to become really your minimum hours. So while you think it's going to be less, it's not. It's going to be more. So you might have your 40-hour job and then you're putting in 20 or 30 hours on your own, you know, consulting type gig. And then you think, well, if I can ever get out of that 40-hour job, then I'll only be working 50 hours. Well, that's bullshit. You're going to be working 80. You know, ask anybody that's been through it. They're going to tell you exactly the same thing. Um, it's just... It's kind of how it works. Mistakes that I see is you're earning income on that side job, that side hustle or whatever you want to call it, right? It's usually something that you really love to do, a passion of yours that you really like. And you're earning income from that, and it's extra income. Bank that income. Don't let that income become part of your your cost of living. Don't let it become part of your lifestyle. Just bank it and forget about it. All right. Because you want that income to come as close as you can to what your current income is. Actually, you want it a little bit higher because your current income, if you have an employer, is not actually what you think it is because the employer has got to pay the Social Security you know, and there, there's other payroll expenses that go into it that as soon as you start paying yourself, you're going to shit. So my goal, my, my advice is just to be safe. Make sure it's 20% higher than what you think it's going to have to be. And then you should be cool. And that will give you a buffer for, you know, taxes at the end of the year if you fuck that up as well. But what people make the mistake of doing is they start stacking the income. So they're putting all the bank in the same account. And then all of a sudden, hey, this car, I can afford this now. And so their lifestyle changes based upon the, the revenue from two jobs instead of the one. And now they put themselves into a financial position that they can't quit the first one and just do the second one. You know, so that's the first biggest mistake I see. The second part of that, which kind of plays along with this, is that second income is usually something that they really, really love to do. And as soon as that becomes a business is the day that they're no longer going to be doing that is their main responsibility. Their main, because that's a technical, it's, that's being a technician. When you start to run a business, you have to run the business, not be the technician. All right. So if let's say it's a personal trainer, you're doing that on the side and you get to a point to where the incomes are about even it's a little bit higher than what your other job is. You're cool. I'm going to quit the other job. I'm just going to do this personal training gig. I love this. Then when you start doing the personal training gig, you realize, fuck, I don't know what I'm doing. How do I get more clients? How do I do this? How do I do this? There's a whole business aspect here that you now have to figure out. And if you want that to grow, you have to become more of a business person than you are the trainer. So you got to keep that in mind as well. So sometimes the answer is keeping it as that second gig and just loving the fuck out of what you do with it and be more selective on who your clients are and what the work is that you do. So if 
I'm trying to think of another example to be able to drive this home. Um, fuck, I'll use, I'll use Josh an example. He's sitting right here. Um, he does some contract video work, right? So he's making, you know, extra money, extra salary, doing something that he loves to do. And I don't know what his future aspirations are. You know, maybe he wants to start his own video company. I, I don't know. Um, that's great. If that's what he wants to do, then someday that's what he's going to do. But if not, if he's just doing this because he loves that type of work, which I know he does because he does it here, then instead of starting his own business per se, and we've never had a conversation about this, by the way, which would be interesting because maybe next week he'll ask me about it. But if that if he ever wants to start <laughs> something like that, you know, then it's a matter of, OK, what I would tell him is, OK, let's figure out why you want to do this. You know, because if it's just be if it's to make more money, well, then, you know, there's definitely obviously that possibility. There's also a possibility to make less and go out of business. Um, there's other there's the other possibility of keep growing the shit out of the side hustle to to where your referrals get to a point that you don't have to do these jobs anymore that you don't want to do. All right. Say it's, um, um, weddings or birthdays or whatever the hell it is. And it's like, every time one of them comes up, he's like, Oh shit, I don't want to do this, but I got to do it because it's the, well, you build that up to where all the referrals come in and his work that he really, really fucking likes to do. Then when he gets to that point, he can charge more for that work because he's going to become better skilled at doing the work specific to that part of the industry so he'll be able to charge two to three times more for that because the quality is going to be better and he won't have to do the other things the 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 work he doesn't enjoy as much you know to be able to make money so that's that's a possibility that i think a lot of people don't look at when they start thinking about being an entrepreneur and starting their own business, doing something that they really love, because you can do something you really love as a side business and build it up to the point to where you don't have to have any clients or any customers that you really don't want. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a hell of a lot of work to get to that point. But that might actually be the answer more so than jumping over to being your sole entrepreneur and business owner because that's the day that you actually become a business owner and not a technician. That makes sense. Would powerlifting survive with no federations? Fuck, I think it already does now. Um, yeah. You know, the, here's the thing. As long as there's a platform, a squat rack, a bench press, in a bar that somebody can pull, there's always going to be a group of people who are going to want to see who can lift the most shit. You know, so federations really don't matter. And that's a, that's a point that I try to stress because I've seen it change so much since, I think my first meet was 83. So I've seen a lot of changes go on with the number of federations and I, I could be wrong. I know I get some of my timelines wrong with this. But keep in mind, I was I was really young when I came into the sport, so I really didn't know the, po the political side or any of that crap. But I do believe there was only the USPF at the time, maybe the APF, but I think that came a little bit after I came into the sport. But there was a split. There might have been the AAU as well. So there, say three. I mean, there wasn't a hundred or whatever the insane number it got to. So there were there was it, it, at one point when you were talking about the the dominant federations, the ones that actually mattered. Like if you went to a nationals and you won it, it actually mattered. At one point, it was the. I believe it was the ADFPA, but it was it was the drug-free version. I think it went on to be called the what it is now, the USAPL. But it might have been called something different in between. I'm not 100% certain, but kind of the same thing. And then the APF, 
which wasn't drug tested and that was really that was about it i mean the uspf kind of stayed around but it, it was so small it really didn't matter so you had these two dominant worlds you know you had the the ipf and then the wpc and those are like the two big things so the nationals mattered you know and the worlds really mattered you know and and both then it mattered and there was respect across the board and then it started to fan out a little bit and you know how it fanned and you know what came up i you know there was nasa there was a um ipa um then others that followed from there but somewhere around 2010 i think it was if you were to check powerlifting watch there were it was more than i thought man it was like 310 federations i mean it was fucking stupid um and only a few have been dominant you know now the dominant federations are the usapl the uspa and then you know the rps maybe you know it's i mean there's a big drop off after those two and there's a couple others that kind of fill in that gap and who knows what the future is going to hold from that standpoint goes but what what i tell people to look at is if they get in the sport they're getting in the sport because they love what happens on the platform they don't need to know what happens behind the curtain they don't need to know what happens behind the platform they don't need to know all the bullshit that goes on in every federation so you can't no federation can point fingers at another they just can't because no federation is perfect no federation is ever going to be perfect so i got to look at this from the lifter perspective because i have no vested interest in any federation whatsoever and the money meets are another thing that's kind of disrupting things a little bit and i don't know if it's a good or bad thing it's up to the lifters to decide you know money in the sport is good but you know nationals really don't mean a whole hell of a lot in any federation anymore you know maybe the usapl can be debated um but any other ones i don't think it really means a goddamn thing you know it's what matters is here here's my thing with the sport find meat directors who are great meat directors and support them because the meat directors are always going to put on the best meats that they can the good ones and they may move from one federation to another one because they just get sick of the bullshit they have to deal with and the bullshit changes you know so find really good meat directors and then support the hell out of them and let them build awesome meats because when you support them then they'll start running more than one or two meats a year you know and so they're that helps helps build the sport the perception of the sport and it helps build you know it lessens the the bullshit that happens at a lot of meets of the sport because more meets are going to happen because the good meat directors are being supported and and talk about the good meat directors if you do a meet near the meat was a good meat talk about how good the meat was we all get you know that you have followers and you have fans and you know if i follow people and you know i like to follow people's certain people's training not everybody's obviously because there's tons of lifters but i want to know how you did you know fuck i want to know how you did after the meet i don't want to wait a day you know i don't wait two days so you know you gotta you post that stuff up i'm never going to be a person that's going to make fun of somebody that's making their post meet report unless you're apologizing to everybody in the world because you had a bad meet then i'm going to make fun of you for that but post up your results but man if the meat director did a good you know did a stand-up job post that shit let other people know so they know hey this is a good meat to go to um, if they did a shitty job you don't need to post that they did a shitty job just let everybody assume they sucked you know that's an easy way to go from there and then as far as your own lifting goes i think you know powerlifting.org is awesome you know and 
I think I've probably promoted them on every freaking podcast I've done so far, but their site keeps getting better and better. And look at your rank. All right. And I, I understand that you can go there and you can select all the right categories and, you know, make yourself a world record holder if you want. But again, you can do that. All right. Do that. You know, pat yourself on the head or whatever you need to do. Fill your ego full of pride. But before you're done, go look at how you rank in the open division of your weight class in your respected category of lifting. Look at how you rank. All right. So if it's 150, if it's 300, if it's 75, whatever it is, make a note of that, man. And next year be better than that. Work your way up the rankings because me coming through the sport, we had Powerlifting USA. So it was a magazine and we, the top 100 would come out once a year and I got fucked because I was the 308. So I got thrown in with the supers, but that's all right. You know, it's, I, I wanted to see where I ranked. Was I, did I rank better than last year? You know, shit at a certain point, it's like, am I even going to make the list? You know, am I going to be able to compete, you know, just due to injuries or whatever you're trying to deal with at the time? But constantly strive to make yourself better. Because I remember when I first got in the top 100, that was cool. It's like, okay, this is cool. You know, I'm, I'm in this thing now. What do I need to do to get in the top 75, the top 50, and so on? And now you have this openpowerlifting.org, which allows you to do the same thing. And um, just do it by the open class. You know, it's going to set your standards higher. You know, set those standards high, man, and work your way up. See how high you can go. You know, that's that's the sport, man. See how high you can go on that list and support the shit out of great meat directors. That's all you need to worry about when lifting the weights. Uh, on to a little bit more serious question here. This, I don't know. I'm not going to say the name of this person, but they said, uh, can I borrow the flashlight for research purposes? <laughs> well, Yeah. <laughs> You probably can because I don't think I I can't say a hundred percent right. You can never say a hundred percent. I know where sure. this is going because there's I mean there's there there's people. It's a, the gym is kind of a key club, so some people have keys. It is connected to the office, so it is alarmed and so forth too. But I mean there are people that are in here by themselves sometimes. So there is there is the possibility that somebody could have fucked the flashlight or the <laughs> fleshlight. I highly doubt it because I it's gross. It's got like chalk and shit all in it and I've never come in here and opened it up. It's not like we're opening it up every day, by the way. But I've never came in here and opened it up and like, hey, look at this. It looks like it's been cleaned. I, I'm, we've never had that, but there could be some dirty bastard in here too, you know, blowing the thing away. But I, I think all you're going to find is, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of ammonia caught up inside that silicone shit. And, um, but we have managed over a period of time to figure out how to, how to work it a little bit better and how to get more kick out of it. But in all seriousness, 90 well over 90 percent of the time it just it just sits in the chalk bowl over there and nobody really uses it now if somebody comes in from out of town yeah you know i'm gonna we're gonna make them use it just because it in what way um the, the ammonia <laughs> no, yeah. the ammonia because it um if you do if you do it right i mean it's and you see i didn't know that you have to leave the bottom open a little bit it's like a vent right where well you got the butthole version right yeah there's the butthole version but see it was i don't want to name the lifter that came out here but you know i was explaining to him how this whole thing came about and that i realized that the bottom came off and i really didn't understand why the hell it came off but you know that you could put ammonia capsules in there and close it and then sniff the ammonia but sometimes it didn't work you know sometimes it worked like really really well and like knock you on your ass other times you it it wouldn't work and it was kind of um it was depressing because i would have somebody come out and like dude you got to try this this is awesome and then they do it it, it sucks and then everybody thinks i can't handle my ammonia and it's like that's not true 
but there's something that's not that's not I, there's something i'm missing here and said lifter who was out here said well dave you need to you need to vent the bottom i'm like what the hell are you talking about and he says well if you, depending upon how far you open the bottom or close the bottom it makes the the silicone tighter or looser and I'm like how the fuck do you know this <laughs> and obviously i know how he knows this you know so <laughs> maybe it just I'm needs like, to be bleached i'm like okay i get it now because it's got little vents in it so if you open it a little bit it allows airflow to come up through the bottom which when you go to smell the ammonia it's going to pull the ammonia up to your nose where if that was shut you don't have that airflow so you're not going to be able to get the ammonia hit that you really want but the the difference with the thing is if you hit an ammonia capsule or you hit those um, salt things, which I'm not really a big fan of, but people use them all the time. Um, you can you you kind of know when it's going to hit because you, you snap the caps, you, your, your hands are going to your nose. So, you know when it's going to hit you. You just might not know how hard. And some of the salts like that dude that was out here during that straw man thing that what's the name of that Cebrus or I can't pronounce the company I sell oh, their yeah, yeah. yeah I sell their stuff and still can't pronounce the company's name Cerebrus or something yeah he had oh my god you know he's got a few versions of the salts that there's one I'm not even gonna I tried the medium version and that was too that was fucked up that was too much but if I stuck that in the bottom of the flashlight this, this lights out but he's got a stronger version, which I, I will never open. But anyhow, some of that shit's getting vicious. But to get back to my point, you, you know when it's going to hit you. When you're sticking your nose in a butthole, that's a <laughs> fleshlight. All right. That's, that shit's got to travel up the, the anal canal before it hits your nostrils. You don't know when it's going to hit your nostrils. That's what makes it such a shocker for most people is because they, they start – huffing on it or whatever the hell you want to call it and nothing's happened and then all of a sudden out of nowhere wham they get whacked which maybe i should I. maybe i should get some of those crazy ass salts and put in the bottom of that thing fuck somebody up yeah. big time but um then again if i sent it off for research purposes i wouldn't have it here to fuck with people plus we wouldn't want that back yeah, the, well the fucked up thing is it's now part of the identity of the gym it's like, hey, man, this is an awesome gym. This is un freaking believable. You know, they walk in and the gym is like, man, this is the greatest thing ever. You know, I've always wanted to see this place. Where's the fleshlight? It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's in a gold it's, glass case. It's, it's, like, it's like, it's in the chalk bowl. You know, so I, I guess I got to work out my sponsorship details a little bit better. And yeah, you get, get Get more fleshlights in here. All right, on a different topic here, what impressed you most about London High School the other day? I'm assuming they mean about the kids, not, um, not the facility and the um, hallways and whatnot. There's, there's a lot of things. I mean, I'm really happy for Jim, so I got to put that out there, is Jim helped start this company. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's the legacy of this company, so I, I will never, you know, be able to give him enough credit for the help that he provided us in the early days. He was the first employee. And then, trust me, the corporate, if you want to call this a corporate environment, but the business environment is not his world. You know, his world is, it's, it's rubber and grass. You know, it's not, it's, it's not an office setting, but, you know, he did a hell of a job for the years that he was with us in an office setting, you know, and all the other shit that we, we did everything, man. It was Jim, myself, Tracy, and Chris for many, many years, and we did everything. I mean, the packaging shit, everything, but I don't want to get into all that. So a couple years ago when he was first brought on, he was also working as a, a coach for the running back coach. So it, one of the – I think it was the first game. I went to the first game, and just seeing him on the field working with the kids was – it was it was a really really fucking cool thing to see knowing him for as long as i have seeing somebody that is in the right environment for them but also for 
what I think he's really here to do and to leave his mark with. So he no longer coaches from the football perspective. It's just the strength and conditioning part. So when he was out the other day, he invited me to come out. And, you know, I took him up on the offer before I asked what time. And um, I am not I am not a morning person, and neither is him. So I, I give him credit for this. So um, he tells me, you know, we start at 830. And to a lot of people, 830 is not early in the morning. But trust me, to me, it's that's about what time I get up. So it's I stay up late. But, you know, so the, the impressive things – there is not a most impressive thing. There were a few very impressive things that I noticed from one observation. And the first was him and his environment again, which is to me, it's always cool to see somebody in an environment that they thrive in and that I think they're really meant to do. So that was cool to see. I, during their dynamic warmups, and I'm not going to go into his whole programming, but during his dynamic warmups, they were doing somersaults, which is tumbling, which is something that kids today, they should be doing, you know, and to see his dynamic warmup stuff being shit that actually kids should be doing was impressive. It's like, okay, this, this is cool. He's, this this is actually being done right and i've been in a lot of conditioning facilities strength and conditioning facilities and i've seen the execution of probably a couple hundred strength coaches with their athletes and what i saw monday was and this isn't because i know jim and have known him forever the best execution i've ever seen with a coach with their athletes in all the years that I've ever watched coaches train athletes. So they, their main lift of the day was the squats and he's got Juliet, his wife working with the JV They're you know, on one half of the gym, no, their form is not great. You know, she's working on their form, but their form is acceptable, you know? So for being JV and for me to walk in there off the street and to say, you know what, this this technique is acceptable and if it was really bad you know like one kid came up so his heels were off of the floor it was immediately corrected and it didn't happen again so to see that the jv is being coached in a way to get them ready for when they make it to the next level to take advantage of you know the same type of programming that was impressive so that was where am I at now? Two or three. Um, the second or third most impressive thing there. The fact that Juliet is helping him is, you know, another thing that's impressive. You know, it's it's hard to work. And they work in a business together. So it's hard to work with your spouse in a business. But, you know, here they are doing it. A volunteer work, you know, as well as a couple, which is, you know, a testament to their relationship, which that is impressive in itself there. The his groups when they were squatting out of all the squats that i saw there no not one of them would be a 10 and i am what jim would consider and i'm using his words not mine a technical nazi and taking and you know i hate to throw the word out there because people will take it out of the wrong context or take it in the wrong context but i'm big on technique man i'm huge on that because i think that's everything were any of their guys a 10 no but were they over a seven every single one every single one and that never happens and that never happens i mean it's like twos and threes and maybe i might see one seven every single one you know so i complimented him on that you know when they went into the accessory training and um and he said, Dave, when you're only doing three or four things, how is it how is it possible for any of them to really be bad? You know, so he he restricts the exercises, you know, so they're doing them more frequently. And you have to know Jim's training to be able to understand, you know, the philosophy on that because he's it's all sub maximal training. So he can have, you know, the same exercise over and over and over again. And they don't have to go heavy. He's 
his kids are strong as hell and they don't have to live max effort weights they don't have to train conjugate systems to be able to do that they're they're still kids you know and so from the technical aspect i was impressed with that from the coaching aspect when he took them through their accessory work it you know what i saw worked kind of like a circuit but not really um again just the coaching of the video that i posted was 30 seconds but that same thing went on for five sets and exactly the same type of participation happened so they started on the minute you know ended on the minute and there was no no bullshit no screwing around um they were all attentive they were all paying attention they were all doing their work when the work was done you know then they head out to the field the kids respect jim which is you know a testament as well so there there wasn't a biggest thing it was more or less just walking out of there thinking you know he's in his right and when you he's in his right element so why would why would i expect anything less than what i just saw that's that's kind of how i felt from the whole standpoint and there's a couple racks in there we need to get the fuck out of there because they look like shit they're not ours they're terrible they look like they're about ready to fall apart so that was like the the thorn in my the thorn in my um hand that still hurts right now because i still see them stupid ass things and i mean they're they are they are bad so it's but they they needed they just brought in five more racks because they did start this whole junior varsity thing going but that that's that's what it is you know i I, i'll try to get over and get more you know jim will be on the podcast here in a few weeks to be able to and he's not afraid to tell anybody what he's doing you know because you're not him so he can tell you everything that you do but you still got to implement it and good luck with that that's a good way to put it uh how would a common power lifter gain access to elite fts to the elite fts gym for a day they don't um it's funny because i started a series on instagram and they're all numbered i got up to nine and it was like the the 10 things that you have to do to be able to come out here and train and like 10 was gonna like wrap it up this is what you need to do and i've never finished it what are the do you know the first nine off the top of your head yeah i mean there's uh, there's a, there's a lot of things. I mean, people need to understand that we're we're not a commercial gym. You know, this we have a group of lifters that train out here a few days a week and then on the weekends. And that group is largely dependent upon you know, people who are team members. So that would be one way you know, become a team member of Elite FTS. If you're a team member of Elite FTS, then you're pretty much can come out here and train whatever the fuck you want um to a certain degree um some of them some of them have keys you know sullivan you know is one come out here whenever he wants makes no difference to me you know total trust you know a lot of these guys would not be team members if i didn't have total trust in them not to say that you know over the years we haven't made mistakes with that but for the most part we're pretty much dead on from that standpoint the the other thing people need to understand is the ones that are out here i'm kind of doing the programming for but i'm teaching them how to program themselves so they don't need me so somebody like a ted tolson which i'm going to try to get on the podcast so you can hear his side you know of the process because he's been i think it's been over 10 years of working with him Ted knows more about training than he even knows he knows about training just because of what's been drilled into his head. But I don't want to have to be out here if I I want to be out here. But if for some reason I'm not here for a week or two weeks or whatever it's going to be, they're fine. You know, they know what to do because they have other people that have been taught how to teach them what to do. So there's that aspect the other aspect is we've been in business for 21 years, which is a long time 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a really fucking long time. And if somebody sends me a DM and they're in town and they want to come out and train, and then I look and see that this person has never made one single order with us, the odds of that happening are zero. They can go down the street and train at three of my competitors' gyms. That's who they're shopping and that's who they're supporting. So, you know, you do business and, and business decisions are based upon values. So our company stands for certain values, which we have listed on our website. And education is a big value, man. Given all the education that we do for free is a big value of Elite FTS, which comes at a huge expense. The expense that we put into the education that we put out is damn near equal to the expense of our cost of goods sold. And I don't, that doesn't mean much to most people listening to this, but when you're in retail, cost of goods sold is your largest expense by far. And our content rivals that. And our content isn't a product that we're selling and getting a return on which most people in the industry do put their content out there and try to get a return on it. And it's a high margin return. You know, an ebook is a high margin return. You know, online training is a high margin return. A lot of these things are high margin returns. I'm in retail. Elite FTS is in retail. It's a very low margin return. So we're giving away our highest margin asset for free to be able to sell low margin, high quality products. So with that in mind, and somebody's telling me they're a huge fan of the site and they've supported the site, they love every, you know, all the stuff that we put out there, they love to come out and train, but by the way, I've never purchased anything from you because I can get it cheaper someplace else. Basically is telling me that you put zero value in the content that we put out so why would you want to come pick my brain and learn from me if that holds zero value? You know, it's, it's confusing to me. I don't understand that. And I'm not telling people and forcing people, you know, shop with Elite FTS. That's not the case at all. You know, shop with whoever you want, support whoever you want. Um, but don't, don't expect, you know, to basically shun and, and not support, you know, a company and then want them or have them be more than willing to open their doors and say, yeah, go ahead, come in here and train all weekend for free. You know, we don't even charge for the training. You know, now if you are somebody that's supported us and you've been a good customer of ours for years, we have no problem with you coming out. No problem. You know, never, I don't think, have we ever turned away unless it's the Arnold weekend or, you know, the, something like that where it's a big weekend. Um, the other thing I have issues with, issues is a bad word. Um, the other problems it can create is there's, there's some weekends where we have all the racks being used. Like last night was a rare, it was a rare training night. You know, every monolith was being used and I think one of the racks is being used. So everything's being used. So if I had three or four people that are coming in just visiting, you know, to train, and then the people who are showing up and coming out here four days a week, you know, training for meets are now having to wait, you know, for their training to even get started because of the visitors that are coming out. Now you can take that however you want to take it, but you know, I got to prioritize the people that are training for the meets that are coming out here four days a week and make sure that they don't have to wait, you know, to be able to train. And they understand some weekends, this is going to be a weekend, for example, I think that's going to be busy tomorrow, I think is going to be super busy. Um, so they understand, so that, you know, we'll adjust their timing a little bit based upon that. The the other component is if I look at it from the standpoint of am I going to have to be 
in the gym during a time that I normally wouldn't have to be in the gym. And if that's the case, you know, say we don't train on Monday and I have to come in on Monday so somebody can be out here and train Monday evening, you know, is that person worth the two hours or three hours that I'm not going to be with my family? You know, and that's, that's a tough answer, man. You know, to me, it's an easy answer, you know, but sometimes, sometimes the trade's worth it. Sometimes it's not, you know, so anybody can visit during office hours. We have, I have no problem with that. We're open from nine to five. We don't have a store, so you don't need to worry about being sold a goddamn thing. Anybody can come out, check out the gym, walk around, you know, look, do whatever they want to do. That's, there's no problem with that ever, ever. You know, it's, it's the training where, you know, that, that's a little, let's just say it's a case by case basis. And that's where it was hard for me to write number 10, because it is such a case by case basis. There could be a weekend where I know that it's going to be really light that we have people that are out of town. Some people are on vacation and there's not going to be a lot of people here. Then I really don't give a shit who comes in, you know, I'm more than, well, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to bring them, even if they've never purchased anything. I'm more than happy to bring them in. I'll work with them. I'll help them with their lifts. I love to do that kind of stuff. But when it comes at a, a cost of a disservice to the people that I am trying to help that are out here, um, then I got to weigh that a little bit differently. The other factor is I never know how many people are going to be here because I don't have rules, so to say, you know, so there could be, um, I remember a few years ago when John Meadows and I were training and it was Saturday was the, the, our leg day. It was the, the brutal day. Um, man, there were some Saturdays. It was just me and him. That was it. You know, two Saturdays later, there'd be 20 people out here, you know, and then back to two people again when there's situations like that and it's we're not in a situation like that right now because we have enough lifters but saturday is going to become spotty here pretty soon um or in the fall it will become spotty like that then i i don't i don't like telling people hey yeah look we train at x time on saturday morning go ahead and come out because if i know there's only going to be that actually nobody's going to be here, I probably won't come out at that time. I'll come out at a different time. I'll come out at a later time. So um, that's the long answer to that. I don't know how else to answer. It's just a case by case basis. You can always DM, you know, I, I'll just tell you no, if you can't, you know, it's not that big of a deal. When you got lean, but stayed huge, what did your diet consist of and how were your training blocks set up? In other words, kind of what were your, what was the training like back then? I know there was uh, Justin Harris and then someone else got you lean as well, I think. I went through four diet phases, I believe. The first one was with, with John Berardi. And that was just normal bodybuilding training. It was that, – the whole goal of that whole diet phase wasn't so much about getting lean. It was just trying to get blood work back on point. And at that point in time, it was pretty much immediately after I made the decision that I was never going to compete again. And the honest answer is I, every time I tried to eat clean food, I threw up. So I was convinced I was allergic to clean food. So there's an article on T Nation that goes into that. John explains a little bit what was going on and how he went about fixing that. So through that training process I never really got that lean but we did correct a lot of the issues that were going on and then I met Justin and that was maybe it was Shelby before Justin no it was I think it was Justin I think it was Justin then we brought Justin on as a sponsor and I was always intrigued with how a national level bodybuilder would turn pro and then 
within the first two years of being pro would put on 30 pounds of lean body mass. To me, it was just a, I didn't get it. It was a, a what the fuck is going on type of thing. And because that was, I mean, to relate that to powerlifting, that would be like finally getting to a level to where you can qualify for the pro meets or the money meets or, you know, the bigger meets. And then as soon as you get to that level, you put 25% on your total. It's like, what the fuck? Like, how is that? How is that even possible? Because it can't be a drug thing because they're already taking everything in the world that they need, you know, that they need or are told to take to turn pro because turning pro is a big fucking deal. You know, it's, it's, it may be a bigger deal in the bodybuilder's career than the actual pro shows at that time in their career. So they're probably more, they're probably willing to take bigger risks when they're right at that edge of turning pro compared to once they get there. But this seemed to happen a lot and I just couldn't figure it out. And I wasn't that close to the sport to kind of know. And Justin's reply was, well, it'd be easier if I just show you. So of course me being me, like, fuck yeah, I'll do this. And um, so I did. And it, it's it's not a lifestyle that I want to live. You know, there's there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, were chemicals involved? Yeah, definitely. Were they more than what I expected? Not really. Um, were they anything that if I was to lay it all out, people would say, oh, my God, I can't believe that? Probably not. Um, am I going to lay it out? No. Um, the reasons for that are you can go look at a past video that I made on PEDs and why I don't like to talk about them. And that will answer everything from there. So from that standpoint, I'm just going to basically say there was nothing really surprising with that at all. It was the fucking carb for, for me, at least with Justin, for me, it was the carb cycling and the amount of fucking food that I had to eat. And the, so the once I got, I mean, it's a process. So it's not like you're just going to go do this. You know, there's there's a process to where I had to get down to a certain percentage of body fat. And then high carb days would come in. And then uh, I think he said something like I wanted a cheat meal like after the first week or some shit. And I forget how he said it, but it was something about, you know, you have so much glycogen in your body right now. You're not going to eat a cheat meal for a month and a half or some bullshit. So um, it, it was funny at the time, but at the same time, it was like, ah, oh, shit, this is going to suck. And um, but the leaner I got, you know, the bigger I got and the, the more high days came in, uh, low days sucked. You know, so anybody that's done carb cycling knows what I'm talking about. The low days are just fucking awful. Um, if they were all low days, I think you would get used to it. But when it's carb cycling, it's like, hey, yeah, cool. I have a high day. Everything feels good except you're shitting every two hours. And then your metabolism, at least it feels like it's an inferno because you're hot all the fucking time. And then the next day is a low day. So it's like you just spun up this car and you just threw it on a track and put it out there with no gas and then the next day you run out of gas and it's just terrible and um but it's a, like i said it's a process and i think we've got videos where justin and i have spoken pretty i don't think we left anything on the table i think it, there's videos with the justin and i where we did a table talk series and i'm going to try to get them out for uh, a podcast table talk here sometime before the end of the summer hopefully and um we won't be talking about that but other stuff and so it was that and it was it was the training during that time period so the carb cycling is what made the biggest difference what was frustrating though was i would look in the mirror on one day and look like i never lifted a weight in my life and that would be after two low days. And then after a super high day, 
I looked like I gained 35 pounds of all lean body mass. And it, it just, it was fucked up. You know, it's so obviously the pictures that you seen and they've been posted were the only the ones from the super high days taken from the best possible angles because i didn't put any terrible pictures out there at all and um so it was it was it was a bitch but it was a challenge that i needed at the time because i I needed something mentally challenging that was kind of like training for a meet and that kind of filled that void that I was experiencing because it's not being a competitive lifter there was after that came an identity crisis so to say so it kind of filled that gap um looking back not in the best way but it did filled the gap so I had the motivation to train now the way I trained during that time period was more DC style training Justin had his interpretations you know of that and then I put my swing on a couple of the things as well because I do have restricted range of motion I still had both my hips at the time and so it was very very high intensity training but it was not seven day a week training it wasn't twice a day training it was very very high intensity training with a lot of cardio the difference between and I think for me, that allowed me to keep a lot more muscle than when I dieted and trained with, with Shelby. I got leaner. You know, I, I definitely got more. I got leaner, but I wasn't as full, you know, as far as the glycogen standpoint. But it doesn't, it doesn't fucking matter because I'm not competing. You know, so the even with Meadows, all every time I did this with all four or all these guys, uh, Justin, Shelby, and John, and a lot of it was just to kind of learn the process, you know, from different perspectives. Like in strength and conditioning, I wanted to learn block methodology. I already knew the Western method of periodization and then conjugate. So I wanted to know different methodologies of the training and the dieting to be able to kind of understand bodybuilding better and i have a great far greater respect for the competitors because of all that and you know shelby's was a little bit different so it was a little bit of a you know a leaner a leaner look with a lot more cardio training was left to left to me so i kind of kept it the same you know more high intensity um four days five days a week training four days a week training seems to work best for me and then with john it was and shelby there's a lot of cardio so even more cardio than justin insane amounts of cardio and with john there was no cardio but the volume of the training was through the roof so there's really no need for the cardio so it was it was different through all those the the takeaway is it's harder than you think the other takeaway is if you're going to diet to an extreme i guess is what you would call it and i wouldn't even say i was to an extreme but if you're going to diet you know under 10 percent, 8 percent body fat with calipers if you're going to if you're going to go down in there you're going to rebound and to kind of get an idea what that rebound is And that the hardest part of all of it, if you're somebody that's just looking to be leaner and always be lean or, you know, to look better is to to, to maintain the look, you know, once you get down there, because it's a lot of work. It's if I wanted to try to get that lean again now. it would be either it would take six months if i tried any of the processes that i used before unless i tried how jm said that he dieted then i could take it all off in a month but um but it would be five months and then by that time you know you're so sick of dieting that you rebound out you don't want anything to do with it so from a long-term perspective what i learned was 
I really don't give a fuck what I look like. You know, if I, I care what I lift more than what I look like. And I've always, always kind of been that way. So dieting and training for how I look is not a really good motivator for me because it's, I would, at this point, I would just rather stay home, you know, now to train, to try to set some type of stupid strength goal that I set for myself, that's got more empowering motivation to be able to get me into the gym and to train hard than what the other does. So instead of worrying about, you know, if I have a vein in my bicep or what my abs look like or all this other shit that did motivate me while I was dieting, because you kind of get sucked into this little fucking void you know, in this lifestyle, you get sucked into it. The um, I use my my blood work is my main indicators for my own training moving forward. And, you know, with the help of Dr. Eric Serrano, we're able to look at the blood work and say, OK, we've we've made a lot of progress. And but let's work on these things here. And my blood work by no stretch of the imagination is is horrible or even bad. You know, it's probably the best that it's ever been. So and that's it's probably better than almost everybody that's watching this. So let's just put it that way. But there's always room for improvement. And that that's fun. You know, right now that's that's the motivator for me is, you know, what can we do to try to, you know, pull this up? You know, stupid shit like that. I need dumb goals like that. that these are healthier goals, but I need dumb goals like that to be able to push me forward and keep me motivated. Did I answer the question, by the way? Yeah, I'd say so. All right. Well, that seems like a good spot to cut it. Thanks for tuning in.